Friends, we're here this afternoon to remember and to celebrate Bob Hockett, who has died. We're here because in one way or another, this death affects us all. We're here to remember Bob, to give thanks for his life and for our own continuing lives, to remember all that was remarkable and good and holy and all that was so very kind and generous about Bob. We're here to listen to some of the great and powerful words of the Christian faith, to hear the stories of friends and families, to laugh a bit, to remember wholly and fully and completely, to dwell in the music, the hymns, the singing of friends. And we're here also to draw our own prayers and memories close to the God who reminds us that our lives are longer than our days. We're here to renew to our trust in God who has said, I will not fail you or desert you. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Let us pray. O oh God, who gave us birth, we come before you thankful for a life well lived and sorrowful for that life's ending. We come before you full of grief, seeking comfort, seeking meaning in this time of grief. So speak to us once more your solemn message of life and of death. Show us your grace that as we face the mystery of death, we may see the light of eternity. Help us to live as those who are prepared to die. And when our days here are ended, enable us to die as those who go forth to live, so that living or dying, our life may be in Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen.
reading from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to gain and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. Hear these words from Psalm 147. Praise the Lord. How good is it to sing praises to our God? For God is gracious, and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. God gathers the outcasts of Israel. God heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. God determines the number of the stars and gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. God's understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. God casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. God covers the heavens with clouds, prepares rain for the earth, makes grass grow on the hills. God gives to the animals their food and to the young ravens when they cry. God's delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor God's pleasure in the speed of the runner, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those whose hope is in God's steadfast love. Extol the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. Please join me in the reading of the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie in green, green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores the soul. He leads me in the right path for his sake's name. Even though I walk around this valley, I fear no evil, and for you, my God, my staff, you comfort me. Your prayer is before me, in the presence of my enemies. The noise of the oil and the cup of the flow. Surely you can encourage about me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God.
have the honor to represent the Hockets at this solemn affair. My parents, Gladys and Norman, gave birth to Robert, myself, Lowell, and my younger brother, Edwin. Robert, known as Bob to most of us, Edwin, known as Ed to most of us. We're lucky to have had such great parents that led us, made us believe in many things, were hard workers, faithful churchgoers, people who really wanted to be an example for the community. Dad was a contractor, mom was a bookkeeper, and worked at homes. To kind of be humorous for a minute, she did a lot of typing for our students at Grinnell College. And regardless of what we were eating, they of course were welcome to eat with us, whether they were Jewish or whatever. Often it was food that was not of their faith, but they ate along with us. They were starch educators. They wanted us to do the most we could do, even though they didn't have the same advantage of getting to go on to college. They had good high school careers. They went to uh, classes as they could afterwards, but they really made it clear to us that our job was to be good in education. Between the three sons, we have eight college degrees. So you can see we did follow what they said to do. Uh, one had a doctorate degree. Two of us had all but the doctorate degrees. Very close. Uh, they were very serious about the schooling. Mom was a um, PTA president at times, and so she was a good example, good leader. Just wanted to tell you a few little things that you're not aware of, probably even the family not aware of. Hard to follow a very serious, studious brother in school. I remember that one class I was in, and the teacher happened to be elderly. She taught my parents. I knew that. I was not the best behaved student. So I guess I was acting out a little bit, and she says, I can remember when your brother sat there. What did I do? I can remember when you, my parents sat here. <laughs> Principal's office. <laughs> That's when I felt they were teaching me how to be an administrator. Uh, another thing that uh, many of you didn't realize, even as serious as, as Bob was, and, and there were some people that he didn't seem to really like too well. And I can remember once we, were, we went to the same junior high high school building together and I, I think I was in late uh, junior high, probably seventh or eighth grade, and he was late high school. And one of his staunch enemies come riding his bicycle down the street where all of us were walking. Must have been about 50 of us walking along it. He took it upon himself to give that guy a good block in front of his bicycle and the guy tossed all over the place, and everyone in the crowd. <laughs> so he had another side to him, and even his even his parents don't know uh, that. I never did tell our parents that we, that we did have that. Another, another example, you know, you know Robert, staunch Michigan fan. You know that. One day he was uh, with me to a Hawkeye basketball game in Iowa City. He was sitting with me and all Hawkeye fans came to a point where it was a real crucial timeout came, gave, we were getting all the final instructions for the last few minutes and game, and all of a sudden we heard a go blue! <laughs> that really shook everyone in the whole fan, but you guys would know being Michigan fans how you, how you would be. Of course, I rank them Hawkeyes, Michigan, and Hoosers, my <laughs> younger brothers. You rank them a little bit differently, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, Bob had some, he did 
trapping, he did hunting, he did fishing, including do a lot of work uh, in school, kept busy all of the time. So he was, he was very, very good about this. Uh, my younger brother tended to be somewhat the same way. Then there was me. I tended to be a little bit different sports person, played basketball, football, ran, golf, everything like that. So a little, little bit different on that side. But when we got at home, we would kind of try to share our thoughts. And really, they shared what they were doing and what I was doing. And all of us really agreed to help each other and do the best job that we could. Uh, remember, Bob just loved to come to Florida. He, Florida was one, he traveled along, along with the family. They traveled all over around here. But they came quite often, and one of the first things he wanted to do was hit that beach and get that tan. And I can remember him coming back from the beach red. <laughs> you know, that's the way he came back to you all, was very red. But he had his tan, and he was really proud of it. When he, you know, uh, really enjoyed Bob's last days uh, on FaceTime. Had a chance to visit with him quite often on that. We never talked a lot during the years, but during that last year or two that he, that he learned how to handle the FaceTime, and I did too, neither one of us were very good at it, but we had really a lot of fun talking back and forth to him for a long time. I'll never miss this, and I've been honored that he was my brother. Thank you. All right. Robert, hi. I'm here to say goodbye to you, but I assure you that you will always be in my heart and mind. The separation caused by our ages and distance was prevented, has prevented me from recognizing and communicating the importance you have had for me. I now want to express how much I appreciated you. I am sure my appreciation for you originated with mom and dad. I know how proud they were of you. I know they had many reasons for this pride. If I didn't know already beforehand, I learned the amount of respect they held for you when mom and dad explained to me that they wanted you to handle their affairs when they no longer could. They made very clear to me the respect they had for your wisdom and judgment. I have always aspired to merit similar respect in others that you have achieved. I was too young at the time, but I can only imagine how brave you were to be the first to leave home to make your way in the world. How proud mom and dad must have been when you were the first in the family to go to college and graduate. What I know for certain is the shining example you set for me. As a result of your example, I knew at an early age that college education was attainable. It was also clear to me the path would not be easy, but I knew it could be done since you had already shown me the way. I suspect that you got most of your intelligence that mom and dad were allowed to pass on so I'm also grateful for the work ethic you demonstrated. That model is what always has allowed me to continue in hard times. I was always proud to be your brother because of all your talents. Not only were you academically proficient, but you could sing and won prizes for your art. You even built your own home. I still remember looking frequently at your scout uniform hanging in the closet I remember studying many times the badges that you had earned. I know my achievements in scouting were a direct result of your trailblazing. Now as I reflect, I wonder how many other intangible gifts beyond my consciousness you passed on to me. As I watch our garden go down the drain, again this year, I realize I always associate gardens with you. I regret that I have not been able to follow in your successful gardening footsteps, but I know I would not have had the desire or the pleasure of trying without your example. I suppose I owe my love of nature to scouting, but I also remember your first job at the Nature Preserve in Chicago. I remember you bringing home a golden hamster 
and a skunk so that I could meet nature up close and personal. Even now, as I religiously recycle, I believe that habit got started when I learned that you were volunteering at a recycling center. Any of the rare times I was able to visit you, it was apparent that you were passing gifts to everyone you came in contact with. I can only wish that I may follow in your footsteps in this way too. Now I must say goodbye. You have been tasked once again with being the first one to leave. And I can only say thank you for being so influ influential in my life. Love your youngest brother, Edwin. <clears throat> I would just like to share a couple memories that I have of my grandpa. Uh, growing up, my grandpa was a big inspiration for how I live my life. Starting at a young age, I was able to play dress up with his old lab coats, and that was the motivation that started me on my dreams to working in the health field. The inspiration continued on with seeing how caring he was with all living things, from plants to animals, and seeing his dedication to making the world a better place. Uh, through high school, I was able to participate in helping him gather food uh, over leftovers of the football games at U of M uh, Stadium for the food gatherers, as well as sharing various nature shows that we would watch together over the summers when he would babysit me. Uh, I love you, Grandpa. I uh, apologize if I choke up a little bit. Uh, my grandfather is going to be remembered in a lot of different ways. For some of you, he was a strong, friendly churchgoer that you saw now and then. And for others, he was a soft shoulder to cry on. I know that personally, it's going to be hard to remember my grandfather in just one way. In fact, a few ways come to mind when I think about him. I remember him sitting in his large brown recliner chair just yelling at the TV for Michigan to push harder, to dig deep and win the game. I remember him showing me birds in the backyard and picking vegetables and just teaching me about plants and animals and what nature is really like. I remember him sitting right outside, right over here, shaking hands with every community member, every cook, every pastor every person that walked by, making sure they had everything that they needed, catching up, just being there for them. I remember all of these things because I looked up to my grandfather, and I still really do. There's a lot of things about him that I can't begin to express my gratitude for. Throughout my life, he was a role model who taught me to be strong and firm, to support my teams and my family, and to really dig deep and work hard when it really mattered. He showed me that humility, attentiveness, and kindness were worth more than anything money could ever buy me. My grandfather was an upstanding man who valued his family and community more than anything else in the world. And I will never forget that, and I will never forget him. As you have heard, a number of uh, words that people have used to talk about my father. Loving, friendly, helpful, a leader, a Michigan football fanatic, a Red Wings fan, a wannabe cinematographer, where he would, he would film the sidewalks as we walked down in, in Hollywood. But looking back on his life, the words that keep coming back to me about him is service, or leadership through service. As my uncle talked about his parents and the environment that they grew up in, just be, during the Great Depression, beginning of, before World War II, just at the birth of the Air Force, he grew up in scouting. We've seen uh, he earned the rank of Life Scout 
was inducted in the Order of Arrow and attended two National, Jam uh, National Boy Scout Jamborees. So he was very heavily involved in that. In college, at Iowa State University and Mich University of Michigan, he did fire jumping in the summer and also participated in RO the Air Force ROTC where you're in the rank of captain and was part of the Arnold Air Service and Silver Wings uh, Service Organization. Much of his life, adult life, was spent as a scout leader for my Boy Scout troop, Wolverine Council Roundtable, teaching others how to lead, teaching himself how to lead, attending training in Philip uh, Boy Scout Ranch in New Mexico. We would take Memorial Day weekends as a family up to Wright Lakes Boy Scout Camp to prepare the scout to the camp for opening that summer. So he, you can see where he would do his service was to his country, to his community, and to church. As one of the founding members of, of Presbyterian Church, uh, Northside Presbyterian Church, an elder and a deacon within the Pres Presbyterian Church, attending Presbyterian National, Con uh, National Conference, doing ministry in jails while at Northside Presbyterian. You've heard about his work in terms of his uh, uh, Habitat for Humanity, Delana Center, and food gatherers. But to me, the two clearest, th two is clearest evidences of this dedication to service was when he stood up to stood up for others that couldn't stand up for himself. He left an organization that he loved deeply because he felt they were not on the right path. He loved scouting, but felt he needed to step away from it to show because his morals were more important in that in that, for him. The other example is one day we were driving home in our station wagon and we passed Pratt Ridge and there's an open which is an open was an open field at the time now it's all built out but there was a wildfire on, occurring and the volunteer style fire department was battling it but probably needed help so with his experience of fire jumping he asked my mom to take us home grabbed a shovel and ventured out to help them. Now, I may be romanticizing this a bit. I don't know his exact role in it, but I do remember those things happening. And as for this fact, and even then, <clears throat> and even in his last days at, at Glacier Hills, he would make sure that, he would ha that people had the church bulletin and hymnals for the church services there. Again, service through the church, service to others. So these are the actions that my father has taught, how to, taught me how to lead. The leader must set the example. And thus, leadership through service is how I remember him. Our scripture reading for this afternoon comes from the story of Lazarus in the village of Bethany with his sisters Mary and Martha. Listen now for the story of resurrection hope. When Jesus arrived at the home of his sisters, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about his brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. 
Martha said to Jesus, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Jesus asked. And she said to him, Lord, I believe. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. Friends, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. Well, it's a tiny little book with a huge punch. It's called A Grief Observed. It's a little book that kicks you in the gut with a great question. Why is it that grief feels so much like fear? It's a question that you don't expect a writer like C.S. Lewis to be asking, especially if you count among his favorites and my favorites of his work is many children's books where the good always wins, peace always prevails, and pain is overwhelmed with joy. In his Narnia tales like The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, I just love it that the evil white witch is dispatched with great joy by the untamable Aslan, the great lion of the land. But in this little book, A Grief Observed, C.S. Lewis allows himself to ask the most terrible questions and to write about his vulnerable feelings. Two massive things had just collided in Lewis's life. Just as he realized he was deeply in love with his best friend, Joy Davidman, he learned that he was about to lose her to a horrible and irreversible illness. Joy's son, Douglas, describes how their deep friendship became almost incandescent with love. Douglas writes, they seemed to walk together with a glow of their own making. But just as they were declaring their love and exchanging their marriage vows, Joy was diagnosed with this terminal cancer. Joy and Jack, as Lewis was known, had three wonderful, rich years of life and sorrow mingled together. When Joy died, it was both grief and love that created the space that the two of them inhabited. The space that Lewis now had to occupy alone, just as Diane occupies a space now alone. That space was immense, it seemed. It echoed. And Lewis, though, spoke into it with his writing about the burden of love that all families know, that we just heard recited from brothers and children and grandchildren. Lewis wrote this, he said, no one told me that grief would feel so much like fear. I'm not afraid, but the sensation is just like being afraid. The same fluttering in the stomach, the same restlessness in my heart. He describes this grief as a kind of suspense. There were so many habits, so many ordinary experiences that are just stopped in midair. It's all made impossible now, he said, because what is changing? Lewis wrote, he said, to kind of draw a map of what was happening in the loss of his dear love. He wrote first to understand it for himself and then to help those of us who follow with that same sense of bewilderment that we know with the death of a child, a parent a friend, a husband, a wife. I see this little book as a gift to all of us who have known death or sorrow or grief, and I'm grateful. Lewis found grief not to be a state of being, but as a flowing process. Grief couldn't be charted because it wouldn't allow itself to be pinned down. It didn't need a map. It needed a history. It needed stories like we heard just now. There was something new to be experienced and described in this state every day. But one couldn't control grief, nope. 
Grief has a mind of its own. Lewis says it leads you down deep canyons with spiraling staircases. It brings you to eerily normal spaces where it seems like you can begin to breathe again following a loss. But then suddenly you're crying again like an eight-year-old child. And then suddenly, without warning, grief takes you by the hand and settles you into something, something like joy made holy, wordless, indescribable, more real than memories. Lewis says this, there's nothing we can do with this suffering, this loss, except to live it. And so the Hockets have for the past days and weeks. We all know that in times like this, the advice we get from friends and colleagues and family members can sound a whole lot like white noise. They're well-meaning, yes, most of them. But there is a line separating the grieving from everybody else in this normal world. So we all need to give ourselves a little bit of permission and space and time to feel the weight of loss as Diane and company have need to give them space to move through it in their own way. My dear friend, one of the other pastors here in this church, lost her husband after a long, wretched illness this spring. And a few weeks after the funeral, to the chagrin of everyone who thought that she should be taking a break, there she was doing the normal work of pastors, pitching in and helping out. It was her way of living through her loss, connecting with others, helping others as she normally did. So what can we say of grief, friends, on this afternoon, except that it is the great burden and opportunity of love. It can't be mapped or stressed or defined. It can only be suffered and experienced. But what must be said what is what must be given is the permission to feel the grief and the loss, just like I've watched the Hockets do. To feel all of it, not as a state, but as this process, a process that we can only gently lead people through. One of my idols, the Presbyterian writer and pastor Fred Beekner, died this week, and he left behind a treasure of books and messages and ideas that have done to shape my life and the lives of many, many pastors. Among the wise and poignant things that Beekner observed is that what is essential to us is that we all be basically human. That in our core, we can be ourselves, our truest selves, and we can be honest to who we are. Bob Hockett was all of those things. And all that Bob was, he was truly, fundamentally human. He was real, down to earth. He was poignant and bright and brilliant. He was incisive and outspoken. He was fully engaged with life and all its quirks and disappointments. Beekner wrote this, I'll read just a little. What we hunger for in this life is, more than anything, is to be known in all our full humanness. And yet often this is just what we fear more than anything else. It's important to tell at least some of the time the secrets of who we are truly and fully because otherwise we run the risk of losing track of who we are and becoming someone else. That was not Bob's problem. He knew who he was and he expressed it day in and day out. I knew Bob to be fully alive, fully human, fully engaged teaching, watching, greeting, welcoming, serving, cooking. I knew him to be alive with his wife, Diane, with his children and grandchildren, with his great-grandchildren. His love and care for them was honest and transparent and enormously generous and kind-hearted. The real and penetrating that Bob, love that Bob shared with his family and friends was maybe not that incandescent love, but it was the slow, steady, rhythmic brightness of one who was confident that he was loved and embraced by God and his family because he was truly, fully human 
and one of God's children. Bob loved camping and being outdoors and gardening and trekking and birding. He loved playing in the lake with his kids and his family. He loved to know joy and he loved to know the company of people around him who would buoy him up and engage with him in conversation. He was a quiet soul at some levels, a, a scientist, a dedicated microbiologist. He was a community activist. His sense of justice and fair play and equity was born of a deep Christian mindset of compassion and service and witness that was always about giving more than one could possibly imagine. And I can speak candidly about his forthright Midwestern candor. In retirement, Bob gave much of himself to our community and made a dent in the injustices that we all know and feel here with people who live on the streets, who are unhoused, or just plain unlucky. The very first time I met Bob, I was working at the Delana Center for the Community Kitchen and I was assigned as the low guy on the totem pole to wash dishes. Bob was in charge, he was a team leader, preparing and serving and cleaning up and meeting with the guests. It was a dark, cold December night and the place was packed, Afro jams, people were cutting up and yelling and screaming. It was alive. Here I was, the new pastor in town, trying to make a good impression and Bob was my supervisor. Apparently he did not think much of my dishwashing skills on that night. They were not up to his Hockett standards and so I earned a talking to from Bob in front of the whole group. You see those people out there in the dining room? He asked, pointing his finger at my half-washed pan. Okay, it still had some greasy spots, I'll admit. I'll admit. Wash it again for them. They deserve our very best. And so I did. And so did everybody on that night give something of their very best because Bob, in his life and his witness, called it out of us. Bob knew fully and completely who he was and what he stood for, and on that cold night I was introduced, well, a little abruptly, to his deep love and compassion and bright honesty of a dear and faithful husband, a father, a grandfather, a great-great-grandfather, and a bright and shiny witness for the love of God. And even when one or more of a whole host and series of devastating illnesses gradually took away his life and reordered how he connected and communicated with everyone, Bob managed to still be fully alive and fully present in all times and places. Living imperfectly with good wit and as much humor as he could imagine, with great realism and grace, Bob had love enough for all. In the end, able to visit Bob along with one of our other pastors in one of his final moments, took great comfort and inspiration from another idea from my friend Beekner. Fred Beekner reminds us that we're all but simple clay jars. And as time goes on, each of us, as a clay jar gets cracked and broken and we eventually crumble away until there's not a single thing left of us except the, the most important thing of all, and that is that we are real. And at the core of us, not even heaven has the power to touch it. There is this space, this emptiness that the jar contained. And that emptiness is never to be confused with nothingness, but it's rather what we call by one of its many names, nirvana, satori, eternal life, heaven, the presence of God. Bigner says, I'm not afraid of that thing, but I'm enormously enjoying this emptiness, this space at the center of my life. For it's there there is new life, a refreshed life, a new start. There's nothing to worry about. There's no reason to fear. Life and death, all of it, is always and forever good 
and holy and present, and it casts out all fear. Friends, on this afternoon and every day, may the goodness of life and the resurrection hope of Jesus Christ, may the presence of our compassionate God frame our memories in appreciation of Bob Hockett this day and give thanks for his one long, remarkable, and compassionate life that we are privileged to share. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Most High God, the Prince of Peace, be born into our world, our lives, and to the depths of our being on this day. Fill the emptiness with hope and with providence and with grace. Wherever there is war in this world, wherever there is pain in our community, wherever there is loneliness, where there is, wherever there is no hope, come thou long expected one with healing in your wings. Amen.
I'm free. Don't grieve for me, for now I'm free. I'm following the path God has laid you see. I took his hand when I heard him call. I turned my back and left it all. I could not stay another day to laugh, to love, to work, to play. Tasks left undone must stay that way. I found that peace at the close of day. My parting, if my parting has left a void, then fill it with remembered joy. A friendship shared, a laugh, a kiss. Oh yes, these things I too will miss. Be not burdened with times of sorrow. I wish you the sunshine of tomorrow. My life's been full, I savored much. Good friends, good times, a loved one's touch. Perhaps my time seemed all too brief. Don't lengthen it now with undue grief. Lift up your hearts and peace to thee. God wanted me now, he set me free. Sorry. Let us pray. O oh God, creator of life, before you generations come and pass away, we remember all of your faithful disciples who lived this life of faith and now live eternally with you. We especially give you thanks this day for Robert Norman Hockett and the faithful life he lived. We praise you for the gift of his life, for all in him that was good and kind and faithful, for the grace you gave him that kindled in him your love and enabled him to serve you faithfully. We give thanks for the life Bob lived and all of the lives he touched. We remember his loving marriage to Diane how they met in Illinois and moved to Ann Arbor when Bob started his master's program at the School of Natural Resources just down the road. Bob's love and joy for life is not only reflected in his love for Diane, but also in his love for his kids, Roy, Karen, and Mary Lynn, and his grandkids, Betty, Dallas, Chase, Collins, and Killian. We remember Bob not only as a loving husband and father, grandfather, great-grandfather, but also his strong love for nature and being outside helping people. Whether it was the times he helped his father build houses or was out gardening or just watching the birds, Bob was at home surrounded by nature and wildlife. We also remember Bob's artistic side, which came as a surprise for many. Especially during his time at Glacier Hills, he found love and beauty through painting and drawing, whether it was scenes of nature or scenes of the cross and so much more. O oh God, creator of life, words cannot describe the pain and loss we feel at Bob's death but we are so grateful for the time and the life he had here, the way he loved his friends and family so well and so deeply, his love for all of the wonderful parts of creation, and most importantly, his enthusiasm and support of the university's football team. During these hard moments of life, may we be reminded of Bob's passion for creation and may every bird we see spark a loving memory of Bob in our hearts. May those memories give us the strength and hope to continue on through the hurt and the pain that we feel right now. And through our sorrow that we have today, let us join together and pray the words our Lord taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine brightly upon you this and every day. And may God look upon you with favor as you go now into the world in peace. So go now. Go now in the comfort and the presence of a God who goes before you and gives us the assurance that our days are longer than our years. Go now in peace. Friends, after the closing volunteer, I invite you down the hallway here to your left to the Curtis Room for reception, a time to tell stories, to remember, to give thanks to Diane and to all the kids and grandkids and to fellowship together in this place. You are all welcome. Friends, let us now sit and contemplate and remember and reflect on Bob's good and long life.